Hello. Good evening, Trinity. We can get started here in a moment. I see the Goosewells are back from St. Louis. We're glad. Welcome home. And we're very thankful for your presence here this evening, and we're very thankful as we again look at this week's topic of uh, people around the passion of Christ, the witnesses. And so we'll be talking this evening uh, about Peter. We're th very thankful that you're here with us tonight. We'd like to have you please stand. We make our beginning this evening in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please turn and greet one another, and then we'll go right into the opening hymn.
O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him in song of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pastures, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be, world without end. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening in this blessed season of Lent. We welcome you. The Old Testament lesson this evening comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 17. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirst there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. The epistle this evening comes from the fifth book of Romans. Therefore, since you have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare to even to die. But God shows his love for us in that, while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Gospel appointed for this day is written in the book for John chapter 4. So so Christ came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. 
A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to Jesus, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to Jesus, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that it is in Jerusalem. That is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me that an hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to Jesus, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Here ends the reading of our gospel. You may be seated. Today we're going to be talking about the life of Peter as one of the witnesses around the cross and the passion of Christ. I'd like to introduce to you, uh, however, another individual. He was a professional thief. His name was a name that evoked fear throughout the wild, wild west. He terrorized the Wells Fargo stagecoach line, roaring like a tornado and spooking the most rugged of all cowboys. During his reign of tower, terror from 1875 to 1883, he stole hundreds of thousands of dollars. No victim ever saw him, no artist ever sketched him, no sheriff could ever track his trail. His name? Black Bart. John, the Gospel introduces another Black Bart. If you've ever felt shame and disgrace, it was his whisper that crushed your heart. If you've ever felt alone or abandoned, it was all according to his plan. If you've ever felt useless or no good, it was his accusing finger waving and wagging in your face. He doesn't just want your money. This Black Bart that I speak of comes to kill, to steal, to destroy everything. What's his name? Guilt. Maybe there's someone on the planet who's not known guilt and remorse or the like, but I've not yet met that individual. I'm sure you haven't either. You know, the guilt that comes to tell us we're worthless, that we should be ashamed for what we have done or not done, but I've never 
met an individual who doesn't have some type of regret. Kind of like the undertoes of the ocean, what sucks us in? What sucks us under? A youthful indiscretion? A backstreet brawl? It's taking something that did not belong to you? Spreading a lie or a gossip that was more than just a rumor, but when whispered into your ear, became the front page news for all that you could put on social media. It may be guilt in another form. Instead of a momentary lapse, it could be a season that you feel as though in your life you've had a failure. As a parent or a grandparent or as a child, as a brother or a sister. You may have blown it in your career. You know, and you feel guilty for that. You, how you've squandered your youth or money or both. Guilt. It seems to be an unwelcome traveler of life that accompanies many of us much of the time. We are now in this series, The Witnesses to Christ. And today we meet a man that was familiar with guilt, Peter. Remember Peter in the courtyard of the high priest named Caiaphas? And it was in that guilt, in that courtyard, we saw Peter surrounded by and entrapped by guilt. Peter's guilt, as well as our own as we look at it. But beyond that courtyard, we see grace. Grace for Peter, but also grace for us. To get into context, we rewind the tape of the biblical narrative and go back to the Garden of Gethsemane where we hear the voice of Peter saying to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you even to the point of death. I will die with you. I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus and Peter had been through m so much together during those three years. But three years earlier, Jesus walking on the north shore of the Galilee of Galilee, Jesus sees Peter fishing with his brother Andrew, and he says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. One day, about a year later, Peter follows Jesus to the Sea of Galilee, and there's a huge storm. And you know, the, the boat that's rocking, and the disciples are all fearful for their lives. And Peter, or Jesus rather, comes walking towards the boat. On top of the water, through the storm and the tough, rough waves that they thought they were sunk. Peter and other disciples thought it was a ghost at first, but then thought maybe it was the Lord, and Peter cries out, Lord, if it's you, bid me, let me come to you. And Jesus says, come. Peter takes that all-important step, that step of faith, but then, like most of us, as we see the world spinning around us and the, all the troubles and the problems and the winds and the waves, Peter became worried by the world and what was surrounding him. And he began to sink. Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and pulls Peter in. He takes hold of him and he saves Peter. At one point later, Jesus and Peter have another discussion. Jesus had asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter confessed that you are the Christ, the living Son of God. And he, he then said, who has the word of God? The living word of God. Where else shall we go? It was Jesus who would take Peter, James, and John along with him to the Mount of Transfiguration and there atop the mountain. Jesus who would proclaim that the Son of Man earlier must die, suffer, be raised on the third day. Jesus took him atop this Mount of Transfiguration and there he, Jesus showed the agony and the suffering that he was going to suffer at the hands of sinful men. But on the third day, he would be raised from death to life. We are reminded again. But it was there on top of that mountain that they saw the agony and the pain and the suffering that Jesus would take. But it was even more familiar when 
Jesus invites this same trio, Peter, James, and John, into the Garden of Gethsemane, the night in which he was betrayed. It's here that Peter, you remember, says, I'll lay down my life for you, Lord. And Jesus says, before the cock crows three times, you will have denied me. Before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. It's there in that garden that Peter's claims became hollow and shallow. It's easy for us sometimes to make claims. It's sometimes easy, and we feel guilty for what we've signed up for or said we would do, but not to be able to do it. When we think of ourselves as younger and people who are going through confirmation, we think about, as Tim and I work through with the confirmands, they say these words, do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word and deed, remain true to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit even unto death? And robotically and routinely, they all say, I do. As we see husbands and wives come to the altar of the Lord, and the pastor will ask them as they're looking at the pastor and then behind him, the cross and Christ. And with their eyes fixated on Christ, in this moment, the pastor says, will you have this woman to be married to you, this man? And will you have this man to be married to you, this woman? And the couple says, we will, I do. And we make those claims. They seem to be so much a part of our everyday life, and yet so often we fail and fall short. As the events in the courtyard unfolded, I'd like to have you think about it like watching a wall of the foundation of a home that is cracked and begins to crack one brick, one section at a time. And you can just see the house's foundation, those cracks slowly spreading. Go back to the courtyard outside of the high priest Caiaphas. Jesus has been taken into the courtyard and is being tried by those who are there, the Pharisees. A servant girl comes to Peter and says, Are you not one of this man's disciples? You know what Peter said. I'm not. That was the first crack. Peter then stands by a fire to warm himself, perhaps on a night like this. And some bystanders say to, Jesus, say to Peter, you also are one of his disciples. I saw you. And Peter denies it again a second time. Another crack. When enough cracks happen, there will always be a collapse. Always. Here it is. One of Malchus's relatives, they spot Peter and they ask, did I not see you in the garden? With Jesus of Nazareth? Peter again denied it. And in the background was heard a rooster crowing. And in one of our Gospels, we actually see that the eyes of Jesus and Peter look to one another. And you can just imagine the guilt that Peter must have felt as his Messiah and his Lord and Savior looked at him and said, I told you. A rooster crowed. Three cracks in the wall. Guilt, shame. For us, the collapse begins or happens when we say just one more. Perhaps one more drink or one more gambling ticket. One more lie. One more. You fill in the blank. We see those cracks that appear in our everyday life. Crack, crack, crack. But one more leads to another, and one more leads yet to another. We always are facing that collapse. And when we start to see what was happening, we start to also see how our Lord responds. Mm -hmm. 
Peter, after the rooster crowed, felt like a leftover. The Lord didn't kick him out. The Lord said nothing more to him. He, he was going to go towards crucifixion. And can you imagine the guilt that Peter must have felt as he deserted the one he said he would die for? Not once, but three times. Guilt turns us into miserable, weary, angry, despicable, du duplicitous individuals stressed out by the sins we've committed. Who hears and who helps? God does. I want you to see what happens as we fast forward now. Jesus, who has hung upon the cross, who has faced death and the agony of death and the wrath of God and paid the price for all of our sins upon Calvary's cross, now three days later is raised from death to life and appears to the disciples. And shortly thereafter, Jesus and Peter see each other one on one on the beach. You see, Jesus didn't wait for Peter to pull all the things in his life together. He didn't say, well, you've got to get your life straightened up, buddy. As a lot of people do as they think about coming back to church, they think, oh, I've got to get my life straightened out before I come up. But what we see here is that what Jesus does for Peter. Jesus doesn't wait until the, he had overcome the problem with his temptations and fought back the demons and had to conquer sin. No, God shows his love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ was willing to die for us. Even after Peter and the other disciples had deserted Jesus and Judas Iscariot had denied him, betrayed him with a kiss. What do we see? We see our Lord still going to the cross. Romans 5, 8. And in the courtyard, what do we see? We saw guilt. But beyond the courtyard, at the cross, what do we see? But Jesus echoing the words saying, Father, forgive them. And it is finished. And when we start to see beyond the courtyard, what do we start to see? We see that Christ died for us. And what we start to see is that it was grace, not guilt, that God was going to be dealing with Peter in. We can call Peter the comeback kid. Who preached the sermon on Passover, on Pentecost? Who did? Anybody? It was Peter. That was the opening service, the inaugural service for Christianity, now the largest world religion of all time. We see who was it that would be writing two of the books of the Bible in the New Testament? Again, Peter. You see, Christ would meet Peter on that beach and he would say, Peter, do you love me? And Peter, the best he could do was to say, Lord, I phileo you, which means, like a brother, I love you. But Jesus said, Peter, do you agape love me like God loves you? And Peter answered Jesus each time, Lord, you know. I, like a brother, love you. And Lord, that I can't do more. But Jesus said, I have done more. His guilt, Peter's, that is, was removed by Christ's grace. And the comebacks of our life, we start to see, it's not dependent on what we have done, but rather dependent only and always upon what Christ has done in our stead. Comebacks don't depend on us giving our life for Jesus, but rather depend on Jesus giving his life for us. You see, Jesus would restore Peter, would use him as a faithful and useful servant, would put him in a position and a place of service in the kingdom of God, the startup of his church, the writing of the New Testament, the ministry to thousands upon thousands. Oh, guilt is an ugly word, 
and an ugly character that haunts many a life. Do you remember Black Bart we started with? He was finally found to be nothing to be afraid of. When the authorities tracked him down, they didn't find a bloodthirsty bandit. No, instead they found a mild-tempered businessman from Decatur, Illinois. Who'd have thunk? The man pictured storming through the Wild West on his horse was so afraid of riding horses that he rode in a buggy. Black Bart, his real name was Charles Bowles, and the bandit who never once fired a bullet because he never loaded his gun. A lot of us fear guilt and shame. We see it as a deadly monster, and it is, because it can rob us of the joys that Jesus has won for us and produced and provided for us. It is a tormentor of our souls, but we can count on that. But when we see that God has replaced guilt with grace, we see that Jesus has made the devil a toothless tyrant. And now, my friends, to quote our friend Paul, you know the rest of the story of Black Bart. May your life be settled on grace and living in that life of the freedom that Christ alone brings us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Please stand and join me. Well, excuse me. We're going to take the offerings and then we'll have the creed following. Thank you. Our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord and Savior Jesus, into your hands we place all our guilt, 
We ask, O Lord, as you have said from the cross, Father, forgive them. Help us to realize that you meant us as well. Help us to see that in you we have a cleansing and a washing in the washer of the waters of regeneration and baptism, and that you have removed all those stains of sin, thoroughly cleansing us and removing our guilt. You have paid the price and the penalty. Help us now to live with the promise, as Peter did, and help us to be restored unto life everlasting and life abundant in Jesus' name. Lord, we also pray for us as we prepare to call an associate pastor. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless Trinity with such a name and that you would provide such means for us to do so. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've provided so many ways for this church and school and ask your continued blessings. Lord, in your mercy. And now we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive now the benediction of our Lord and Savior. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you his peace.